Today we pick up with the medieval church. After the fall of Rome, the Christian church is split into the Eastern and Western churches, just like the Roman Empire was split up. In the West, you had the Pope, who was the head of the Roman Catholic Church. And the Roman Catholic Church is going to grow in strength and wealth. In fact, it eventually becomes the most powerful secular force, as well as the most powerful spiritual force in Europe. Now, secular means worldly, that it had a part to play in politics and government. So it was involved in the world, not just in religious matters. So the authority of the church eventually spreads because it becomes very much involved in politics and government and, and even the economy at times. So the belief was of the church was that um, all people are sinners and that they are doomed to eternal suffering. And you can avoid that by participating in the sacraments. And the sacraments are the sacred rituals of the church. So by participating in the sacraments you could achieve salvation and salvation is eternal life in heaven however if you don't participate in the sacraments you don't get salvation you don't get to be in heaven according to the medieval church and eventually the church will create its own body of laws it's called canon law and it has its own court system and we're going to see how that will eventually affect um, the relationship between the church and the monarchy but canon law applied to religious teachings, it applied to the behavior of the clergy or the priests, and it applied to marriages and morals as well. Now if you refuse to obey church laws, you could be excommunicated. And excommunic excommunication means that you cannot receive the sacraments. Basically, they're denying you heaven. So it's kind of the worst po punishment that you could possibly get. They're not going to punish you here on earth. They're going to punish you by making sure you can't get to heaven. So for the very religious people of the Middle Ages, that was the worst, most extreme punishment possible. You could not be buried in sacred grounds. If you, were, uh, if you died while you were excommunicated, you could not be buried in Christian land. And you were shunned by other Christians. They would look poorly upon you. You couldn't do business with them. You weren't allowed to marry into a family. So it was probably the worst punishment you could get. Now the interesting thing about excommunication is that the nobles could be punished as well. So finally the peasants and the serfs have equality with the nobility. They both can be punished equally by the church. In fact the nobles had another punishment that was used against them and it's called interdict. And an interdict is where you exclude an entire area, like a town or a region or even a kingdom, from participating in the sacraments and receiving a Christian burial. And so if you, if you had a, a king who wasn't uh, being nice to the Roman Catholic Church, the, the Roman Catholic Church could place an interdict on this king, on his kingdom, which meant none of his people are going to be able to receive the sacraments. They are excommunicated as a kingdom. And so this is going to put a little bit of pressure on those rulers that they have to give in. Otherwise, uh, if they don't, their people are going to rise up against them and they're going to be replaced anyway. So it, it is a way that the government or that the church has a role in government and can influence how rulers behave. The church also influenced how people in their daily lives behaved as well. Most Christians had no contact with the Pope or the higher clergy. Most of their contact with the church was through their local priest. And so each village had its own church where it would perform baptisms and marriages. But it was also a social center as well. That's where you came together at least once a week and you got your news and you got your social gossip and all that kind of thing as well. However, these village churches eventually are going to begin to compete with each other because you want more people to come to your church because that means more money for your church and more money for God. And so these churches are going to begin to house relics. And relics are the bones or blood of martyrs or other holy figures. So someone who died in the name of, of Christianity. You want to have like their blood or you want to have a bone from their body or their skeleton, um, something that you could house in your church because then you then um, this would draw visitors to your church because some of them were rumored to perform miracles. Like there's some that um, if you touch a certain skull, you could be cured of all your illnesses. Or if you touched a certain bone or a certain statue, you 
um, women would do it to, to get a child. Um, maybe they were having difficulty getting pregnant, so they would go there. So these were ways that, that people could, or villages were able to get more visitors, and these visitors would come and make pilgrimages to, pay, to pray before the relics. But if they're visiting the village, they need to have a place to stay, they're going to need some food, maybe they want a souvenir. So this is a source of income for the village as well. So you wanted to bring more people. You wanted to have a very prestigious sort of relic that is going to attract a lot of visitors. So it's kind of a competition. Another way that the church could make money was through something called a tithe. And a tithe is a tax that is equal to one-tenth of your income. And it was required of all Christians that you paid one-tenth of your income to the church. And the church would then turn around and use it to help those who were less fortunate, to help the poor. Women were also very active in the church as well. Uh, the church is going to teach that men and women were equal before God. However, the only time that men and women are going to be before God is when you're dead, when you're in heaven. That's the only time you're going to come face to face with God. And then you're considered equal. On earth, however, women are inferior to men. And what we see the church sort of promoting for women is two very extreme roles. The first role is that they were daughters of Eve. Now, Eve was one of the first two people on earth according to the Bible and she is the one who led Adam into sin and caused problems and got him kicked out of the Garden of Eden and all that kind of thing. So one view of women in the Middle Ages was that they were daughters of Eve, that they were weak, they were easily led into sin and they need guidance from men because men know better. The other hand is the other major woman in the Bible is Mary and Mary is the mother of Jesus mother of God and so Mary was pure she was pure in spirit she was the virgin she had a virgin birth um, she was modest so she kind of just was like the all-around perfect woman sort of thing so if you thought of, of women that way you know women were supposed to be pure but you're supposed to have kids so it's kind of hard to be pure and have kids at the same time you're not everybody's Mary mother of Jesus kind of thing so it's really two very extreme roles there's very little to follow in terms of a realistic role model because if you can't be Mary you're gonna be Eve and nobody wants to be Eve because Eve's kind of weak so um, it was very very difficult for women to know who to follow as a role model now the church did try to protect females. They did set a minimum age for marriage, and that minimum age was 12. So women could, girls, young girls, age 12, would be getting married, but no younger. You could get engaged younger than that, but you couldn't actually share a marriage bed until age 12. They also would fine men who seriously injured their wives while beating them. They didn't outlaw beating wives. They just made it a or they made a fine for men who seriously injured their wives while doing that. But there is a huge double standard. Um, if anyone was caught being um, outside of marriage or having an affair, women were punished much more severely than men by the church. So it's a huge double standard that even though they both sinned, one gets a worse punishment than the other. Within the church, you do have two groups of people, the monks and the nuns. And the monks kind of get their start in about 530 with the Benedictine rule. In 530, a monk named Benedict is going to found a monastery in Monte Cassino in Italy. And his Benedictine rule, this is a set of rules that he created in order to regulate life in the monastery. In this... Um, in his rules, he, he included things like taking an oath of poverty, um, taking vows of chastity and obedience. But basically, the, the chief duty of a monk is to pray because you are to pray for all those who don't have the time to pray to God and to worship God because they're out working or they're in the fields. And so monk's job, that is what they're con considered to be their primary job is to pray for those who can't. But he also taught the value of manual labor. And so he made it a requirement for the monks to work in the fields or doing other tasks so that they also knew what kind of hard work the regular ordinary people were doing. Um, with the monasteries and the, and the convents, they both provided basic social services for their, their areas. Um, things like hospitals and they helped the poor. They established schools and they would uh, gather food and and 
help feed travelers and give them a place to rest. So it's kind of like they were a hotel at times too. But eventually they become centers of learning. In fact, most monasteries and convents are going to work to preserve the writings of the ancient world. And usually they're just copying down the works. They're not really writing anything new themselves. They're just copying out down what somebody else had already written. But some of them are going to take more interest in the culture around them and they're going to write summaries about the works that they're reading. And they're going to teach those works to other monks. So the learning is continuing to spread. So that's a good thing. Among some of those monks that took that higher interest is going to include a monk from England called Venerable Bede. And Venerable Bede, when he is writing, he's going to be the first one to use the designations of BC and AD to date historical events. So prior to him, there was nobody dating things that way. So he is kind of going back in history thinking, oh, you know, about 100 years ago, so that's like B.C. or A.D., so he designates the before Christ in Anno Domini. There's also missionaries that are involved with the church as well, and these missionaries are help, helping to spread the teachings of Christianity throughout all of Europe. So you have a couple of different examples. St. Patrick is going to go to Ireland. And I don't know if you know the story of St. Patrick, but he goes to Ireland and, and apparently he banishes all the snakes from Ireland. And that's why there's no native species of snakes on Ireland. That's kind of the, the folk tale or the myth. Um, and then you have St. Augustine and St. Augustine went to England to convert people there and to t spread religion there. And he actually gets beheaded while he's there. So it's kind of a dangerous job to be a missionary. So he becomes a saint because of that. Within the church, you're going to see a lot of reform movements. Um, the success of the church itself, the fact that it is spreading and getting more and more money and more power, is going to bring on more serious problems. As people become wealthy and more powerful, their discipline tends to weaken. And so these clergy who are supposed to be devoted to prayer, according to the Benedictine rule, are going to become more worldly. They're going to be living in luxury. And most people thought that that wasn't right. Um, the monks and the nuns begin to ignore their vows and take on money and, and aren't always obedient. And some of them even be, uh, become married. And so these married priests are going to concentrate more on their families rather than on the church, which was totally not the point of what they were supposed to be doing. So there is this huge demand for reform that changes need to take place. And one of the major, major reformers is going to be Abbot Berno of Cluny which is in France. And in the 900s, he's going to um, become an active reformer of the church. And he wants to revive the Benedictine rule, those oaths of chastity and poverty and obedience and, and focusing on prayer and all that kind of stuff. And so he is going to basically disallow, he does not allow the nobles to interfere with the monastery. He wants the, to keep the, them separate. He wants the, the government to be separate from the church because he thinks there's too much negative influence there. And so he wants to fill his monasteries with those who are entirely devoted to religious pursuits. He wants people who are there because they truly believe in Christianity and they are going to devote themselves to prayer. Um, other monasteries are going to copy Abbot Barano, and it's called the Cluniac Programs. And so they're going to copy his program of what he was doing. Eventually, the Roman Catholic Church is going to get a new pope during this reform time. And this is Pope Gregory VII. And Pope Gregory VII is going to prohibit simony. And simony is the selling of positions in the church. It had been past practice that when a bishop died or a cardinal died that the government of whatever country they were from would have a say. They could purchase that position and put in someone who was maybe related to their king or was of the nobility. Maybe not necessarily a very religious person, but it was a political move. So. Um, Pope Gregory VII felt that that was the wrong thing, that he's getting too many non-believers or not strong enough believers to be in the hierarchy of the church. He's also going to outlaw marriages for priests because he felt that they needed to focus on the religious part of their life and not the family that they had created. And so he's going to insist on the church also choosing the church officials, not the nobles and the clergy. So he felt that it was very important 
or the nobles and the king, sorry, it, that it was the, the clergy's job and not the nobles or the king's job. So from this, we're going to see a very different approach coming from the religious side of it. A lot of different groups are going to break off from the Roman Catholic Church and create their own little uh, segments of Christianity. Among them included the friars, and friars were priests who traveled, and they traveled throughout the countryside, and basically their main job was to preach to the poor. Those who didn't have a church or didn't have a priest or didn't have access to a village that they could go to church regularly, they would go around to these poor and, and preach the, the gospel to them. Another group are the Franciscans. And the Franciscans were founded by Francis of Assisi, which is a province in Italy. And the Franciscans are going to preach the Christian message. And what their main focus is going to be is on good works, of doing good deeds and helping people out. Another group are the Dominicans, and the Dominicans were founded by Saint Dominic, who is from Spain. And the Dominicans lived in almost absolute poverty. They would wear these horsehair sacks that um, for clothing instead of um, like a, a normal cloth. They would wear something that was very rough and, and itchy. Um, but they were upset by the spread of heresies. And heresies are teachings that differ from the accepted Christian beliefs or doctrines of the church. So they didn't like these other groups that are forming that are saying different versions of the Bible. They didn't like that. So they're going to go and try and, and root those out and, and squash their stories kind of thing. The last group are the Beguines, and the Beguines are founded by a group of women. And they were made up of women who did not have really sufficient financial means to enter a real convent. So they're kind of the poorer women. Um, a convent was usually, a convent with nuns is was usually meant for those women who were upper class, who had property or dowries that came with them that they then gave to the convent, which the convent would use for income, for money. Um, but not all women had a dowry, or not all women were from the upper class that wanted to enter a convent. So the begins are going to begin for those kinds of women. And they are going to support themselves by weaving and embroidering. In fact, they're very famous for mo many of their tapestries that they weave. Um, they're in high demand by the, the monarchs. They also will minister to the poor and set up hospitals and shelters to uh, help their communities. So you can kind of see how religion has transformed throughout even this early period of the Middle Ages and it, how it's gone from uh, being very much about religion to not so much about the religion and more about the money and power and then reforming back to being more about the spreading of Christianity.